Hey folks, Roger here. Man, it's been a while since I made a video and I owe some of you an update. There are some rumors about me that I'm here to confirm. I am becoming Catholic. This is gonna come as a shock to many people and I wanna be delicate and sensitive. I have both looked forward to and dreaded making this video. So many of you know me face to face in person and you might be an atheist you might be a Baptist, you might be Presbyterian, and so many of you who I'm thankful for you for watching my videos from really everywhere, which is kind of cool. Uh, you might be a Muslim, you might be a fundamentalist Baptist, um, various belief systems, stages of life, and places around the world. Thank you for taking the time to watch the videos. Here's what I know. We all have different starting places, and so when I discuss Catholicism, I'm not going to be able to answer every objection. I'm not going to be able to cover everything. It would take a 10 hour video. So it's possible I'll make additional videos in more depth about certain topics, but I just feel that those of you I owe, I know face to face, I owe an update. Why am I becoming Catholic? <laughs> I know for my atheist friends and so many of my Protestant friends, especially my Baptist friends, this sounds insane. It sounds like I am joining a cult, like I am joining the Mormon church, that I am now superstitious, that I've compromised the faith. My head has been there. Uh, I have been able to put my mind pretty thoroughly into a fundamentalist Baptist mindset. I've put my mind pretty thoroughly into an atheist mindset. Um, I understand those ways of thinking. I can't answer all of your objections, but I wanted to give you the update. So why am I becoming Catholic? Well, I watched Nacho Libre and Sister Act, and I thought, man, I, I gotta get in on that. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but good movies. I'm gonna give you four categories of reasons why I think Catholicism, Catholic Christianity is true. So, as many of you know, I was a, I was just a guy in the Deep South who grew up hearing about God and the Bible, not really living a devout Christian life. And when I became a teenager, um, I don't want to make anyone look bad or complain, but I realized when others around me weren't living a devout Christian life, I needed to live a devout Christian life. I know, I knew I needed God. So I got all in with the independent, uh, fundamentalist type Baptist church that we went to. And I want to say this at the outset, uh, and I mean this sincerely and genuinely. I will forever be grateful, forever, for the Baptist people who, when I needed God in my life, encouraged me to live a holy life, to seek God. There's something about those Mississippi Baptists, the Georgia Baptists, singing out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Um, people who volunteer to go to church on Sunday morning who might love God and preach the scriptures as they understand them. There's value there, and I'll be forever grateful for those people. Now, while I don't want to insult anyone, <clears throat> can I say honestly that everything in some of those churches was spot on? No. Um, some Christian pseudo-intellectuals really have some pretty bad ideas. So when I went to this church and got all in, um, I was dev devoted myself to ministry. I went to seminary, to a Baptist seminary, um, studied scripture, studied church history back to maybe the 1800s. Um, I was all in, and I thought that whatever questions I had about the faith would sort of be answered in these seminaries, right? Uh, that when I studied deeper, these guys had it figured out. And when I just went and heard it, 
um, went to seminary and heard the classes, took the classes, heard the rest. Man, I, I'd have the full foundation. I'd have the full grounding. I know exactly why we believe everything that we believe. I've shared these things with you before. Unfortunately, for all the good things about Baptists and about um, some of these um, Christian public figures, that was really all there was. Uh, there wasn't anything more. So I've told you before I had questions about the faith. And it came to the point where in ministry, I was serving God. I loved and to this day love the pastor with, for whom I worked. Um, the people at that church loved my wife and me, my family. And we left on good terms. But I know that I knew um, I had certain questions about some of the things that fundamentalist Baptists lean towards. And I thought, I want to preach the gospel. I want to help people. I have questions about the faith, but really some of these things that um, these really well-intentioned Baptist people will believe, I struggle with that. Um, I'll give you an example. Some people um, who are intelligent people are what's called a King James onlyist. They think that only the King James translation of the scriptures is God's preserved word in the English. And I kind of bought into that for a while. And then the more I studied it and looked into it, though it was uncomfortable for me, I realized that that was an untenable position, right? That I can't really maintain or preach that the King James Version or translation of the Bible is the only valid English translation. It would have been easier for me to hold to that, but I came to the conclusion that the evidence just didn't bear that out. It's not a tenable position. Now, that doesn't mean that those King James only didn't make valid points about other translations of the scriptures. There are some bad translations. There are um, some translations that don't translate certain things as well. That's all, that's all true. But as far as the position itself, King James only is, well, I, I can't. I can't preach this. Um, young Earth Creationism. Very intelligent people are young earth creationists, and I understand why. For me, that's not a key issue of faith. It's just not a key thing. I tend to think that the evidence is overwhelming, that the earth is much older than 6,000 years. Um, but I would be a Christian either way, whether the earth is 6,000 years or eternal. I'd be a Christian. But these differences of visions, if you will, led me to see, man, I can't really stay in good conscience in a fundamentalist Baptist mindset. So I departed as friends. I was going to go become a military chaplain as a Baptist. I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. It's been a few years. But in the Marine Corps, some things changed. And really, whatever doubts I'd had about the Christian worldview, about the faith itself, caught up to me. I think there are reasons for that. Some of it's my own foolishness. Some of it is some of the bad ideas that some Christians had handed me. Some of it is probably because in the Marine Corps out in the field training for combat, you're not really able to take part in a Christian community. Um, anger, bitterness, despair, com confusion. I just started to wonder, why do I believe any of this? Like so many people already do. How do I know God exists? How do I know Jesus rose, existed? How do I know he rose from the dead? Well, um, so many of the Christians I've known in Baptist circles begin with the Bible. They think the Bible is God's word. And because it's God's word, it says Jesus existed. So, case closed. Well, how do I know the Bible's true? Well, for some of my Baptist friends, this was an openly circular reasoning. We know the Bible's true because it's God's word. Well, how do you know the Bible's God's word? Because it says so. And whatever it says is true. Well, I started thinking, is there any coherence with the external world, what the Bible says? Does it cohere with evidence or what we can know from human reason? And I stepped back, and I never became an atheist, um, but I considered it. I read Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and all the big new atheists. I read Nietzsche. I read Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, I read quite a few atheists, um, contemporary atheists. Uh, and as I've told you before, my faith was almost leveled. 
I just almost gave up on the whole thing. I like I was telling my wife we had difficult conversations. I'm like, I, I might be out. I don't know. Thanks be to God, a friend of mine named Nick Peters was trained in Christian apologetics, right? So he, I reached out to him and he said, Roger, you're, you're not understanding things well. You're not even, the problems you have with Christianity are because of your more fundamentalist leanings. I'm like, okay, well, help me out, Mr. Big Shot. And I sent him tough questions, what I thought were tough questions. And Nick did something wise and he didn't give me simple candy coated answers to difficult questions. He said, Roger, if you really want to know, go read this book. This is a dense philosophical text. If you want to know, hash through it. Don't argue with a, an ignorant Christian. Argue with a Christian that's very well educated and, and thought through and see what the scriptures have to offer. See what Christian philosophy has to, to offer. And don't straw man Christianity like the atheists so often do. Make it look silly or pick on as silly as Christian you can find and attack that. That's an easy target. Take the best Christianity has to offer, understand it, and then go for that and see what you can do. Well, lo and behold, um, I learned that virtually every historian who studies the matter, whether they're Christian or atheist, of course they think Jesus existed in history. Uh, there's sufficient evidence. There's pagan writers who talk about Jesus of Nazareth. There's Christian writers outside the New Testament who talk about Jesus of Nazareth. Um, you'd have to explain why Christianity became a religion um, without Jesus of Nazareth. Um, basically, historians accept that Jesus of Nazareth existed, that he was crucified, and that his followers thought that he'd risen from the dead. Now, that doesn't mean he did, but that's not what some of the new atheists like Richard Dawkins were telling me, that he didn't exist at all. Well, that's all silly. He existed. Okay, well, what about if he existed, that's fine. Maybe he's just a member of some religious, maybe he's just some religious figure of some prophet, some whatever, failed apocalyptic Jewish prophet. But what if God exists? And so I studied not pop, contemporary apologetics. Uh, the word apologetics is a good word, but for me, it can mean people who think something is true and arbitrarily try to reason for it. And they're just going to try to trick you into it. I didn't want that. I wanted, I wanted the meat. I wanted to know. So I read Thomas Aquinas. And when I read Thomas Aquinas back in college, I misunderstood him. So his work, he's a, I think, 13th century Italian Catholic Christian philosopher who spoke in Aristotelian terms, Aristotle's nomenclature. And he showed that the coherence of belief in God with reason in the world that we see. So when I read him in college, I thought, excuse me, I've got allergies. I thought, man, this guy's this guy's a moron. He his whole argument depends, I thought, on Ptolemy's outdated views of motion and inertia. Um, I thought this was Ptolemy's sort of a um, spherical view of the cosmos where everything's in spheres and this thing moves this thing and that thing moves this thing. And I thought his arguments depended on that. I'm like, oh, okay, this guy. My friend is like, no, man, you, you misunderstood him. By the way, some advice. If you take one of the world's greatest thinkers from history and you think you read him once and you just trumped him, examine yourself. Uh, these guys are the world's greatest thinkers for a reason. Um, sometimes they take a little bit of work to figure out. Well, I read contemporary philosophers who were called Thomists, like Ed Fazer, who's a Catholic. And he explained in, even though Aquinas' arguments were in English, I didn't understand the concepts. So Ed Fazer translated those concepts into a way that I could understand. And I thought, these are pretty solid. So between the Kalam cosmological argument, which I think is good, um, but really some of the, the older, denser arguments for God's existence, deeply rooted in philosophy, scripture, reason, uh, observation, I came to see God exists. Uh, this, is, this is reasonable to believe that God exists. But I also started to believe that I would be foolish to not believe God exists. I think God simply exists. And when we talk about God, really, um, it's difficult because this reality is so far beyond us that we don't always have words for God. So sometimes we have to speak in terms of analogy. Um, 
So we say God is a being, but he's really more than being. He's the grounding of being. Well, I started studying all of these reasons to think that God exists. Thomas Aquinas' Five Ways, um, Plato, Aristotle, um, contemporary arguments like the Klom, the ontological argument for God's existence. And I started thinking, okay, well, some of my atheist uh, mentors over here seem more intelligent than some of the Christians I know. That really, when you compare them to the strongest Christian philosophers, boy, are they shallow. Um, atheism is easy for young, angry men who are anxious against the system and their authority, and they don't trust people. But when you really study it out and see it for what it is, you understand Nietzsche, you understand Sartre, and then you understand Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, etc. C.S. Lewis is helpful. You understand uh, theism is a much more intellectually tenable position. I can tell you with all of my heart, I just wanted to know it was true, and I wanted to do it. I was willing to become an atheist, and that was hard for me. But I thought, maybe this isn't true. But then when I saw, no, God exists, and with or without the Bible, I can know Jesus of Nazareth existed, that he was crucified, that his followers rose again. Well, I connected those two things. By the way, if you want books on the life of Jesus of Nazareth, N.T. Wright wrote a great book. It's a giant tome, like seven or 800 word pages. It's called, I think, The Resurrection of the Son of God. If you're a bookish person and you want to really dig in, get that one. Also, Mike Lacona and Gary Habermas have shorter, more digestible books on the resurrection. Uh, check them out as well. Or you can watch lectures on YouTube. What I notice is a lot of times internet atheists are harder on the history, skeptical of history itself, more than professional historians who are atheists. Professional historians who are atheists, with the exception of a few, um, all know Jesus of Nazareth existed, that he was crucified, etc. Uh, internet atheists who want to think he just didn't exist, that's not a tenable position. I wanted to follow the evidence. I studied the evidence. Jesus existed. He was crucified. He resurrected. Or his followers thought he resurrected. But if miracles don't happen, then his followers simply thought he resurrected, but they must have been mistaken. So I looked at alternate explanations for the data. I could go on and on. Um, at the end of the day, I understood that if God exists in the classical sense, in the sense that people have understood him, even Aristotle had a sense of this, Plato had a sense of this, I think, the classical Christian philosophers, as he's presented, as God is presented in Scripture, and God interacts in the world, and there are good reasons to think that this reality exists. So if he exists, and all the explanations fail for Jesus of Nazareth's resurrection, except for the one that suggests he really did resurrect, coupled with the belief that God does act in the world, I'm like, okay, this is not only rationally coherent and fits with the evidence, I thought for a time maybe belief in Jesus, his crucifixion, his resurrection went directly against the evidence and I just had to turn my mind off and believe it. No, 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 no. The belief in the existence, crucifixion, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is deeply coherent with the evidence that we have. Especially when you take in the existence of a God who really acts in the world, who cares about our lives, who cares about you and loves you. Okay, so I'm back in with Christianity after a period of struggle. Here's what happened then. I'm in the Marine Corps. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity simply is Lewis's way of trying to explain key concepts in Christianity and saying without all the doctrinal issues, the disagreements between Presbyterians and Methodists and Wesleyans and Baptists and Catholics and Anglicans and Lutherans and all the other. Let's just take the core belief system of Christianity and see if we can talk about this and make some reasonable sense of it and explain this to people in modern audiences. And by modern, I mean, I think 1940s, 50s. It was helpful. Let's not argue about the doctrine. Let's just explain the core pillars of this belief system. So because I was 
I have no interest in defending myself. Um, but just to maybe help folks understand, um, some people have said I've been inconsistent. I, I get all this. I, I get it. Where I've been in my mind and heart, I'm actually kind of a simple guy. People think I read all this theory and deep stuff. I'm telling you, I'm honestly just a simple person who really wanted to figure it out. Got advanced degree, studied it, read way more than my degree required. Because I want to know what's true, and I want to do it. If it's atheism, I was willing to do it. If it's fundamentalist Baptists, I'm willing to do it. If it's whatever, I'm willing to do it. If it's true, I want truth. That's where I was at. So when I doubted and I came back to firm belief, more than ever, that Christianity is true, I rested in what's called mere Christianity. God exists. He exists in this beautiful way. Um, anytime somebody tries to express God to you in a way that is easily digestible, um, they're definitely reducing the concept of God. Think about it. Um, in quantum mechanics or even astrophysics, there are concepts that people, the smartest people on our planet, have difficulty with. It's sort of like if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you probably don't quite understand quantum mechanics. We know these things exist. We know these things, these subatomic particles behave in these strange ways. We know these things mathematically and some of it through observation, but uh, we just can't quite wrap our heads around it because this reality is just beyond our experience. It's just beyond uh, the human mind. But we know they're there. I think God is that times a jillion. Uh, God we know exists, but he is so far beyond um, the human's mind's ability to rationalize, right? I knew that. God is real, but he's so much greater. He's not illogical, but he's so much greater than I had conceived before, which was a terrifying, humbling thing for me. Well, then I just want to rest in what is mere Christianity because I know this is true. God exists in this beautiful trinity, as Christians call them. The trinity is not illogical. It's deeply logically coherent. It's beautiful once you begin to understand it. But this presents God in a way that I can't fully wrap my head around, which makes me think that actually makes sense of what I would expect of God. Um, if it were logically incoherent or contradictory, I couldn't accept it. But Christianity presenting God as a trinity is deeply beautiful and coherent. But just like quantum mechanics are beyond our minds in a certain way, the trinity is beyond our mind in a certain way. It's a mystery. But God exists in this way, as C.S. Lewis will talk about. The deity of Christ. Who was Christ? Was he just a prophet? He was much more. He had a human nature. He's fully man. But he was also... This God that's beyond us come to be with us. This person of the one God born of a woman. A woman literally birthed this person of the Trinity into the world. She was his mother. And I was willing to rest in these things. And I did. But a plot twist in my life happened. My friend said, Roger, you need to work on an advanced degree. Okay, sounds good. So as I was studying philosophy, culture, history, scripture at a deeper level than I've ever studied it, I'm doing these things privately because I'm a private person. It's hard for me to talk about my personal life, which is why people find me distant, and I'm sorry for that. Um, I like to talk about big ideas and concepts and keep my personal life to myself. Um, I'm doing all these things privately, and some of you have known me during this time. It slowly began to dawn on me that Christianity historically, the Christianity that I now thought I could defend, was a little bit different than the fundamentalist Baptist Christianity that I had had helped me when I was a teenager in my 20s, that I'd served with. Are they Christians? Oh, yeah. Um, many of these people love the Lord. They're devout. They believe that the same things about God and Christ, the scriptures. Um, the historical Christianity, I slowly began to realize was slightly different. So just like I have different categories of arguments that lead me to think Christianity is true, here's what's happened.
I have several different categories for why I think Christianity has always been Catholic. Now, see a G.K. Chesterton, I think someone said, if someone asks him why he thinks Christianity is true, he'd have to say something like, well, that's like asking me why I prefer civilization. What would you say? You would just, it's such a big concept. It's everything around you makes you prefer civilized humanity over non-civilized humanity. So G.K. Chesterton said, if you ask me why I think civilization is good and true and better, I would just be like, well, I don't know. It's huge. It's everything. It's a, there's a bookshelf over there and uh, there's, there's peace and policemen and roads and all this stuff. That's how Christianity is. Christianity is so deep in Western civilization. Nietzsche knew this. Sartre knew this. Um, pop atheists on the internet will gloss over this. Um, even some of the new atheists will think, man, we don't owe Christianity anything for the development of Western Civ. <laughs> uh, if I were an atheist, I would be forced to believe, if I were honest and well-read, that Christianity has deeply shaped the fabric of Western civilization for a long time. Well, just like I think there are a lot of reasons I think Christianity is true, there are several categories why I think Catholicism is true, and they're connected. The four categories, just as a spoiler, will be scripture, history, philosophy, and then my own personal experience of seeking God. In all this process, I wanted to know it is true, and I wanted to do it. So... When I came to the place where I can defend Christianity, one of the things I would say is that Christianity has shaped and influenced and built Western civilization as we know it. There are some classical Greek and Roman things deeply ingrained into Western Civ. But when Christianity happened, this explosion of this religion throughout the Roman Empire that disconcerted the Romans, there were Roman writers talking about what is this strange new cult spreading through our empire that we can't stop. Why aren't people staying classically pagan? What, what, what is going on here? That really began to change the world. And you can track it forensically through history and reading the source text behind me. Um, in the ancient pagan world, human dignity, belief in human dignity and moral worth, isn't the same as what we assume in modern thinking today. We assume that modern that people have human dignity and moral worth and rights. That hasn't always been a thing. Christianity definitely changed that. Now, before an atheist says, well, Christians sometimes persecute people. Yeah. But it's simply also true that Christianity changed the way people see this. Uh, the Roman pagan empire had some very despicable practices with children. Christianity changed that. Because of this shift in views of humanity that were all created in God's image, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, child, slave, rich, poor, senator, we all have moral worth. We all have moral duties and responsibilities. We all have rights. Well then, because of that, charity. I can't find charity in the ancient pagan world. That's something that developed because of Christianity. Hospitals. Scientific progress. There's a book called um, The Beginnings of Western Science by David Lindbergh. I don't know that he's a Christian, but he's just talking about the European scientific tradition in philosophical, religious, and institutional context from, context from 600 BC to 1450 AD. Well, when you start looking into this, Christianity shaped this. Yeah. Here's what I didn't want to look at. What kind of Christianity was it that began carrying out the teachings of Christ, transforming their lives and society? There were no Baptists. Now, my Baptist friends think the Baptists secretly existed underground, going all the way back to Christ. It's not true. In fact, um, we could talk about that for a while. Um, Baptists will try to ally themselves, some Baptists will try to ally themselves with heretical groups throughout history. And say, hey, see the Donatists, they rebaptized that the Catholic Church was oppressing we Baptists, the true Christians, and St. Augustine. Okay, 
That's actually not true. Um, there's no evidence of that. And I know that because I've read the source material. I read St. Augustine against the Donatists. Um, the Donatists would probably condemn modern Baptists, and Baptists would condemn them. They're not Baptists. Sometimes Baptists, to try to show that they go all the way back to Christ and the Apostles, will literally align themselves with heretical groups with heretics. Um, just to show that they pre-exist the Reformation. But Baptists don't. So Roger Olson is a historian who's a Baptist. He's a credentialed historian. Uh, in this book, A Story of Christian Theology, um, he talks about the origin of the Baptists. And he says, the earliest Baptist congregations emerged out of Puritan congregationalism in England. Baptists grew out of Puritanism, which is a reformed part of the Reformation, and probably some Anabaptist influence. Um, Baptists didn't go all the way back. When you look at the Christianity that was shaping the world, it's Catholic. There's no getting around that. I've come to terms with it, but that was challenging for me. You say, well, yeah, maybe they had some things right. The Muslims had some things right. Yeah, some, some Muslims have some things right, yeah. And I admire that about many noble Muslims. So you're like, well, maybe it's like that. No, these are people taking the teachings of Christ transforming their lives, applying it to culture and society, and it changed the world, and now we live on the shoulders of giants. We take the good things today and take it for granted because of these Catholic Christians living out their faith, even in science, metallurgy with the, the monks, for example. Now, have some Christians been anti-science? I know them today. There are Christians now who are anti-science, always have been. Have some Christians been superstitious? Yes, that's true. It's also true that today, atheists are also can be superstitious. Not all, but some. We're not all just relying on reason and science anymore. Uh, some people think the earth is flat, um, who are non-religious people. Anybody can be superstitious. And it's also true that Catholic Christianity was revolutionizing the world. And I began to see the teachings of Christ transformed the world, and it did it in... Catholic and Orthodox Christianity, not in low church, non-denominational Baptist Christianity. Now, is there value there? Perhaps this is a good time to say this. I know, and I'll always be grateful for my Christian brothers and sisters who are Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, non-denominational, which is a big thing now, Reformed, which is a big thing. I'll always be grateful for you guys. I'm not naive enough <laughs> Uh, to think that some folks, uh, I know I'll lose friendships over this. And I understand because 10 years ago, I'd be where you are, thinking I'm losing, leaving the faith, corrupting the faith, joining a cult. I get that. So if you have to unfriend me or break fellowship or think I'm crazy or insane, I get that. By the way, I do want you to know the official position of the Roman Catholic Church on you if you are a baptized believer who's repentant of your sins, placed your faith in Christ, accepted him in, the ba in baptism, they think you're a Christian if you're an Orthodox Christian. And they know that the Holy Spirit is working in your religious communities. I thought about that with um, some of the country Baptist preachers who helped me. I think, man, you can't tell me God didn't use that preaching to tug at my heart. I know that man's a Christian who helped me. The Roman Catholic Church's official position there's actually an a, a official document on this. Unitatis um, Redintegratio. Don't ask me to spell it, it's Latin, but it just means um, sort of like reintegration. What, what do we do with all these Christian communities that splintered off as a result of the Reformation? They're saying, well, so many of them are genuine Christians who just don't know the history of this and don't understand the bigger picture, but they're Christians living for Christ, seeking God where they are. God knows that and blesses that, and the Catholic Church recognizes that. So if you cut me off, I understand. Um, just know that um, the Catholic Church recognizes that you're a Christian. <laughs> the irony of that. Well, I began to see that it was Catholic Christianity shaping all this. Another part of the history. Um, the Reformation. We can talk about this at length. Um, so many Protestants will talk about what's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. And they will talk about the Roman Catholic Church oppressing, persecuting what they see as true Christians, um, 
Wycliffe, Tyndale, uh, Lutherans, Anglicans. We'll talk about Bloody Mary in England, um, et cetera, et cetera. Some of those things that happened. John Huss was, the, the Catholics allowed, I think, the secular authorities to put him to death. Um, some of those things did happen. Some Catholic bishops have been corrupt, even recently. Um, but here's the other side of that. Western civilization still had, until the modern world, to some degree, Aristotle's view of politics, in which the state should not only provide for the maximum liberty of people, but promote what is good. During the Reformation, that was rather subjectified. The institutions that had said, this is what's good, here's what's good for human flourishing, here's what's moral, here's what we should promote, and you could say, well, maybe they took it too far. But as the mindset, that fragmented. Men like Martin Luther pushed against the authority of these institutions. And then he wondered when he said that he might have said this, that every Christian is his own pope. I'm not sure if he actually said this. Every Christian is his own pope, but essentially you just need the scriptures. Uh, we don't need the councils or the popes. We just need the, the scriptures. Well, then by the end of his life, he's wondering why people don't listen to him. Everyone thinks there's an expert. Everyone thinks that they can understand the Bible for themselves without the historical intellectual tradition of the Christian faith or the institution. It just fragmented into a bunch of denominations. That led immediately to social upheaval and wars. Henry VIII in England persecuted Catholics severely. Queen Elizabeth in England persecuted Catholics quite harshly. So Catholics did persecute Anglicans. Anglicans persecuted Catholics. I actually met Ian Paisley, who was a big, big uh, Irish uh, figure. And he considers Rome the whore of Babylon, the Pope the Antichrist. And I think when they asked him one time, why are you so against Rome? And he pointed to a date in which I believe it was Irish Catholics who killed um, some Protestants. It's a tragedy. The other part of that story is, though, is that the Protestants were persecuting the Catholics. The German princes, who did want the authority of the Catholic Church, uh, were pretty happy about Luther. And wars broke out because people are corrupt. And I think something like 8 million people died in Europe. There was plague and war, and the war was a direct result of the Protestant Reformation, the social upheaval that it brought. In England, there's a book by Eamon Duffy called The Stripping of the Altars, and there's another book um, about the unintended Reformation, how the Reformation quickly led to the secular, modern, agnostic-slash-atheist world that we live in. These devout Christian men made some unwise calls, and in England, you had beautiful, historic Christian churches where mobs of people would go in and break apart the altars, strip out the religious art because it's now it's idolatry. And art immediately began to secularize. Sacred art was seen as bad. All of these things I'm wrestling with, okay. Well, the Baptists didn't do that. Well, the Baptists weren't around. But the Anabaptists, some of them did. Uh, some of them Anabaptists violently took over a city. The Puritans. Some people hail some of the Puritans in England as heroes. Some of them are devout Christian people. But they are some violent takeovers. Um, the Westminster Confession. Um, there's violence attached to that. It is not just Catholics persecuting people. It was a time of social upheaval and war. Not good. And that's why so many people in the modern world, including the founding, some of the founding fathers of America, were like, I'm done with all of it. Right. All these things are sinking in. Now I want to connect that. I think God exists. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, was buried, and rose again. I think mere Christianity is true. What do I do with the history of this? I don't want to live forever in 
mere Christianity. I want full Christianity. What is full Christianity? So, um, they weren't Baptists. So a few books on this. Um, I like to read source texts. This is volume one of the Anti-Nicene Church Fathers. It was translated by Philip Schaff, I believe. But basically this is, it's even a Protestant translation. But the first hundred years or so of Christian writings after the New Testament. Some things were being written here as the New Testament was still being written. So these are very early beliefs. And what I thought was the Catholic stuff was all medieval corruption. I thought it was accretions, add-ons, tack-ons. And you could say perhaps some other practices might be. But what about what is full Christianity for the early church? This is what made me further uncomfortable. But I wanted to follow the evidence. I had to study this out. I wanted to know what is true. And I wanted to do it. And it's taken me time. Um, I backed away from teaching and preaching when I was working on my graduate degree because I needed to, I needed to focus on my studies. And then over time, I began to see these things. Um, some people wonder why I haven't preached as much or taught. Because I began to realize, as these things were sinking in, that if my Baptist friends, etc., non-denominational friends, knew what I believed, they wouldn't keep asking me to preach. So I began trying to follow my conscience, at least. Not perfectly, but backing away. I'd only speak about things that I knew all Christians agreed on. But eventually I knew, hey, if these guys knew what I am starting to believe, uh, they wouldn't ask me, so I'm just going to turn them down. Um, so that's why I did that. What did the Apostolic Fathers say? Wow. Okay. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying all of the Christian history for the first 300 years, all the Christians agreed on everything. Oh, no, no. There were disputes. They disputed icons. Uh, they disputed lots of things. What I do know is that they agreed, without debate, key things that I as a Baptist can't accept. All of them, without exception, not even debating it. They thought baptism is much more than a symbol. Much more. They thought that the communion, the Lord's Supper, and they used the word Eucharist, which is a biblical word, thanksgiving, Greek word, is much more than a symbol. And I began to think the New Testament definitely teaches, definitely, without question, that these things are much more than symbols. As so many of my non-denominational uh, Baptist friends think. Maybe the Presbyterians had it right. Maybe it's more than a symbol. It's a sacrament. And Christ is spiritually present or something like that. This is not, emphatically not, what the early Christians believed. And I don't think it's what Paul teaches either in the New Testament. So, just a couple of texts for you. Um, this is an Anglican scholar, J.N.D. Kelly. He has a book called Early Christian Writings. Uh, it would probably be more comfortable for him to not accept some of these things, but he's honest with the evidence, and he says a couple things. He says that in the early church, that the belief in the real presence of Christ was unanimous. He says that they believed that Christ, realism, it was uh, unquestionably realist, thinking Christ is really present in the Eucharist. Baptism. This is an Anglican. He says, as regards its significance, it was always held to convey the remission of sins. Always held to convey the remission of sins. That's hard for a Baptist to hear. Um, and that sounds crazy or superstitious or like magic. It's not. We can talk about that. This video is going to be long, so we might have to talk about that in a separate video. Um, let's just look at a few here. I want to read you some source text. So this is Ignatius of Antioch. He's writing to um, the Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, same one Paul's writing to. So jo uh, Jesus trained John, the disciple whom he loved. They were close. 
the Lord that I've given my life to, who I think is the risen Lord, the King of Kings, who established a real kingdom that you and I should be a part of, that wants to redeem not just Israel, but restore our fallen humanity. He trained John. They were close. John trained Ignatius. This is very close. What does Ignatius say? He says, he's talking about Christ, his only, God's only begotten son, and the firstborn of every creature, but of the seed of David according to the flesh, being under the guidance of the comforter, in obedience to the bishop. He's talking about the church coming together under obedience to the bishop and the presbytery. By the way, the presbytery, there's a Greek word called presbuteroi, which is, in the New Testament, it often means elder. But it's also, English wasn't a language then, came about much later. The word priest in English is derived from presbuteroi in the New Testament. There would be no English word priest without presbuteroi in the New Testament. The presbytery. An undivided mind, breaking one and the same bread, which is the medicine of immortality and the antidote which prevents us from dying, but a cleansing remedy driving away evil, which causes that we should live in God through Jesus Christ. So Jesus trained John, and John says that, this is very early, says that the Eucharist, the same bread, is the medicine of immortality and the antidote which prevents us from dying. Okay, well, maybe that's just a, um, maybe that is just a one-shot. Maybe they didn't all think that. They all thought this. Here is Justin Martyr, another early Christian, talking about the administration of the sacraments. He talks about the Eucharist. And this food is called among us Eucharistia, the Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true, and who has been washed with a washing that is for the remission of sins and under regeneration, and who is so living as Christ has enjoined, for not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our blood and flesh, our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished. So they didn't use the word transubstantiation, but he uses the word transmutation, and the concept is very it, it's the same. The developed word came later, the developed definition, but the concept is the same. This this uh, bread and wine is prayed over by a prayer of consecration and by transmutation nourishes our us because it is the flesh and blood of Jesus who was made flesh. He keeps going. Um, and he says, because this is what Christ taught, this do in remembrance of me. This do in remembrance of me, by the way, that's priestly language. It's it's liturgical language. It's not, he doesn't mean just remember me. This is Christ setting up a new covenant. So the early church believed that baptism was much more than a symbol. They believed that the Eucharist was much more than a symbol. Okay, well, why Catholicism? Why transubstantiation? Why not a spiritual presence? Um, some things about this. If you would read anything St. Augustine wrote, Many times Protestants will look to St. Augustine as, this is our saint, he's with us. Read him more carefully. Read St. Augustine's own faith and works. You'll see his doctrine of justification. It is not a Baptist doctrine. It's not a Lutheran doctrine. It's not a Reformed doctrine. St. Augustine was thoroughly, deeply, 100% Catholic. Now, some of the things hadn't been defined in his time that came about later, but by what was defined at the time, theologically, he was all in. Read his book on faith and works. It might change your mind if you are a Reformed person. Um, at least you'll stop. <laughs> you'll stop looking to him to be your hero. He definitely believed in baptismal regeneration. I've talked to some good, devout, Reformed people, Calvinist Christians, and I'll say, hey, why do, you, why do you baptize your children? Well, because the scriptures are a little unclear. We see every instance in the New Testament of somebody repenting and turning to God. But they are, um, those instances are adults making decisions and being baptized. So it's, we don't see that 
children are baptized. But then we look to tradition and we see St. Augustine baptizing children. Okay, we'll read St. Augustine on baptism. He believes that baptism remits the original sin we inherit from Adam. He believed in baptism or regeneration. By the way, Luther was pretty big on baptism too. So if you're a Baptist, Reformed, non-denominational type person, um, Luther thought you needed to be baptized uh, to be saved, frankly. Um, because he said baptism isn't a work. He said, that's a work. Well, tell Martin Luther, the guy who came up with sola fide, um, he would say, baptism isn't a work. You need to be baptized. This is the universal position of Christianity until the modern world. Why? Putting it all together again. The modern world reduces everything to its material substance. It's reductionist. I think so many Christians of every stripe have so many secular and materialistic ideas in our minds that we've inherited from culture, that we've absorbed from culture, that we're already partially non-believers, we're already partially atheists, partially secularists. We might think God exists far away somewhere, maybe, um, but the world is mostly just matter, and that's kind of how we live our lives, many of us. Not in the ancient or medieval world. There's a piece of art um, I'd like to show you. It's in another video. Um, this art shows the spiritual realm, the transcendent realm, that Plato knew about, that Aristotle knew about, and the physical realm in which we live. And it shows because of Christ, we know that they're connected. The Christian worldview has always been sacramental. These sacred mysteries by which God broke through into our material universe out of love for you and me to be with us, to rescue us from ourselves, from our selfishness, from our self-righteousness, from our sin, our despair. And he loves you and he broke through that. And because of that incarnation of God who came into this material realm to be with you, to suffer with us and you, to die for us and to rise again for us, breaking death's back to give us hope. I accept that. And so I knew that the universe doesn't work. The model of the cosmos is not the material one. It's the theistic one. And so there's more to the world than this, than matter. Matter is not bad but it's connected to the transcendent. Some common sense examples. Beauty. There is real beauty in this world. A waterfall. What the James Webb Space Tele Telescope is sending us back. Beautiful. Not just because I'm evolved to think it's beneficial to me, but because I can sit there in awe of the beauty of Beethoven, or this sunset, or this waterfall. I know that my wife loves me, and it's been a saving grace in my life. When I see my children, I love them. This is not cascading neurons. My neurons are cascading, but I love them. That's a transcendent, immaterial thing that's connected to the physical thing. I love them, and they love me. My mother always loved me. And it's been a saving grace in my life. Materialism can't account for that. It has to reduce it to its physical component. Cascading neurons. Chemicals. And that's all it is. Love is more. Beauty is more. Virtue is more. Rights are more. Human dignity and moral worth are more. That's the theistic worldview that I think Catholic Christianity made so much sense of. And that's the reality of a sacrament, the transcendent and the physical. St. Augustine said this, a sacrament is a physical thing that contains the grace it signifies. It's the transcendent meeting the physical. What is baptism? You say it's magic water. No. What is baptism? Baptism was a practice before John the Baptist, before Christ. Baptism was a ritual cleansing, and the word baptizo can mean to immerse, 
but really the Baptists get so caught up in the, the immersion part, they, they might miss sometimes the bigger picture. It's a washing, it's a cleansing, but ye are washed, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he said, it's by the washing of regeneration, referring to the Old Testament laver. Um, in Israel right now, there are, forgive my mispronunciation if you're a Jewish person, but mikvahs, they are baths, literally left over from the ancient world, uh, in which the Jews would take these ritual cleansing. The early Christians would baptize people in those. It's a ritual washing. But because of Christ, it's not just water. It's the transcendent meets the physical. In Adam, we all die. In Christ, we're all made alive. We are washed. We're cleansed. You say, is that scriptural? That's what the, all the early Christians believed. Um, J.N.D. Kelly says that baptism was always taken to remit sins. Um, I could read you so many quotes from this about baptism. Um, it's taken to be entry into the new covenant to remit original sins. Now, what about the thief on the cross is what a Baptist is saying. What about people who were never baptized but accepted Christ as Lord? They're not in hell. Um, God has given us this way, these sacraments in which to give us grace. But he's not bound by them. He's God. So if someone repents and tr believes the gospel and never makes it to the baptismal font, he's not going to let them go to hell. God is never unfair. My personal opinion, Romans 2, um, is that I have hope for people... The Native American Indians, those who shun truth and God and goodness in their heart, um, I'm deeply concerned for them. But those who lived outside of the Christian world, who sought truth and goodness and virtue, Romans chapter 2, I have hope for them. God is never unfair. Not even to the thief on the cross. Not even to the person who repents and believes the gospel and who would desire to be baptized, but never makes it. And yet, the New Testament seems to tie baptism with something much more than simple. And all the early Christians thought this because of this sacramental worldview. What about the Lord's Supper? The same thing. Here's what helped me with this in Scripture. The New Testament mirrors the Old Testament. So the books of the Old Covenant... And then the New Covenant, we call it the New Testament in the Scriptures, but really it was a New Covenant instituted by Christ that eventually became books that were compiled into the New Testament. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Some people who write fiction books will talk about um, how the best kind of book is when you have all these foreshadowings and expectations and then in the end, there's a plot twist that doesn't surprise you in the sense that it came out of nowhere, the sense that it fulfills all those foreshadowings and those expectations, but in an unexpected way and gives you more. That is Christianity. That is Christ. That is the Bible. Some people tend to think that the New Testament abolishes the Old Testament, the law. And now for a, a moment, I sort of thought maybe... These superstitious ancient people in the Old Testament. Ugh. No. Um, all these things. The Passover meal. Christ instituted a new Passover. He said at the Passover meal, the Last Supper. He broke this, but he says a new covenant he's making with you in his own blood. And he broke the bread and he said, this is my body. He broke the bread and said, this is my body. And he took the wine and said, this is my blood. It's the new covenant in my blood. Now, as a modern person, we might miss over that. But everyone knew that the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, was the Passover of the New Testament. This is the feast of the New Testament. And that's why Paul in 1 Corinthians says, Christ, our Paschal Lamb, our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, we don't need any more feasts. Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast, the feast of the New Covenant. You've got um, Paul in the New Testament, writing in Romans, Galatians, Colossians. He is thoroughly Jewish, and he's quoting all these expectations and hopes from the Old Testament and bringing them in. 
So in Romans, I think, 6, he's quoting Deuteronomy. Now, it might be easy in your devotions just to read Romans and forget about Deuteronomy, but he's importing his theology from Deuteronomy. What does Deuteronomy say? Uh, he's importing the, uh, the hope that one day in the circumcision, God would not only circumcise the flesh, he would circumcise the heart. That one day God would take away our heart of stone, as the prophet said, and give us a heart of flesh. And that one day in Malachi, Gentiles around the world would offer incense to his name. Not just Jews, but one day the foreshadowing that God would fulfill in a greater way than the Jews had, and what they had was valuable, but in a greater way, God was going to restore all of humanity, and not just with physical things, but with deeper things, things, physical things that contain a spiritual reality, a sacramental transcendent reality. You say, yeah, is that scriptural? Deeply. Deeply. Um, for example, in the new covenant that Christ instituted, what does Paul say in Colossians chapter 2? He says in Colossians chapter 2, he states this about Christ in whom the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and that you have come to fullness in him who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ when you were buried with him in baptism. Paul explicitly says that in the new covenant Christ instituted, Paul thinking as a Jew, this is the circumcision of the new law of Christ, as Paul says in the new covenant. The circumcision of Christ is baptism. Now that's, for, he's thinking, as he is in Romans as well, of Deuteronomy chapter 30. And in Romans 10, when he's quoting, when Paul says, the Romans wrote, as so many Baptists know, um, the word is very near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. That's Romans 10, 8. Well, he's quoting Deuteronomy. What's the lesson of Deuteronomy? Even if you are, Deuteronomy 30, even if you are exiled by the ends of the world, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. God wants to restore you. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. This is Colossians 2. See, the New Testament writers saw the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It's foreshadowing something, but in a greater way is it fulfilled than anyone could have imagined. Paul in Romans is saying, Hey, my heart's desire, brethren, is for Israel to be restored, to be saved. But how, is, how are they going to be restored? As you know, Israel was conquered by the Babylonians, the Assyrians. They're gone. Those tribes are gone. Where are they at? How is God going to restore them? And for Paul, he's saying, they're scattered around the world. We're going to them with the gospel. God is going to restore Israel in Romans as he restores humanity, because this is the plot twist. It's not just, the Messiah is not just here to restore Israel. Our humanity has been tarnished. Our race is broken and fallen. We can't save ourselves. But Christ, in his goodness, offers a way for all humanity to be restored. And that's why, in the New Testament and in the early Christians, these sacraments, these spiritual realities attached to the physical because we're spiritual and, real and physical creatures, God gave those to us. That's a lot to take in, but please look into that. Please read St. Augustine. Please read um, Ignatius. Please read Irenaeus against heresies. Read Justin Martyr, a dialogue with uh, anything Justin Martyr wrote. These things won't take you long. Read Shepherd of Hermas. All these things, and you'll begin to see this is a sacramental worldview. Well, isn't that salvation by works? Profoundly no. So many of my Christian friends, um, here's the biggest point of disconnect between Protestants and the traditional Catholic Church. It's something called the doctrine of justification. This was my biggest hang-up when I was studying historic Christianity before the 1600s. Many of my Baptist friends will read back to the 1800s. A few of my Protestant friends will read back to the 1600s, 1500s. Uh, it's interesting, um, they won't read much beyond that. But Christianity's been around 2,000 years. Uh, it would behoove us to read the scriptures in light of early Christianity. See, when I was studying the evidence for the life of Jesus of Nazareth, I tried to take ancient writers in their context, pagan, Jewish, Christian. 
and that helped me to understand. If you take a hermeneutics class in seminary, hermeneutics means basically how to interpret documents, how to interpret the scriptures. They'll tell you, you need to see these things in their original context. Who was the original audience? Who was the original author? How would the author and audience have understood these things? I'm telling you, if you do that, um, the non-denominational, um, mere Christianity only begins to sort of fall apart. Not fall apart, but you begin to see that we have a reduced, modernized, less flavorful Christianity. We could talk about this for just hours and hours. Here's the key point between of difference between historic Christianity and the Protestant Reformers. The Protestant Reformers were often, many Protestants are devout Christian people, which the Catholic Church recognizes. Um, some of them didn't like authority, some of it because of some of the corruption, which has been exaggerated, um, the selling of indulgences, things like this. Well, really what that was is the Catholic Church, as far I've read the documents um, from the bishops and the archbishops, um, they were trying to build uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, beautiful place. And so what they would do is they would raise money as charity. So an indulgence, the church never approved the selling of indulgences. But what they did do, and it was taken advantage of, um, I don't think it's terribly widespread, but it did happen, is that if you commit a sin, yes, the eternal consequence for your sin is paid for by Christ, but the temporal consequence of your sin, you need to make that right. It's like physical therapy. Um, I had a shoulder injury in the Marine Corps. It wasn't great. And to make that wound heal, I had to do physical therapy. Um, I had to rebuild that muscle. The idea of indulgences, penances, penance, all these things is meant to be like spiritual, physical therapy. If you wrong someone, God will forgive you, but you still need to make that right in this world. And you also might have wounded your soul in this. You need to make that right. If you deprive someone, give to charity. Um, if you've shunned God, pray, etc. Well, one way in which that was carried out at the time of Martin Luther was you could give in the sense of charity to the building of St. Peter's Basilica. And they say, yeah, well, this time that you spend um, after death in purgatory, which, by the way, the best book on purgatory I've read is C.S. Lewis, who's an Anglican. Uh, the best explanation of this so far is called The Great Divorce. We'll have to talk about that later, but... Um, Purgatory isn't a second hell. Purgatory isn't a second chance. If if you die a Christian saved uh, and right with God, but God's presence is holy, you need to be you need to be made fit for heaven. This doesn't need, necessarily need to be a duration of time. Who knows what it is? But it's simply um, this part of us being made fit for the presence of God. If you're there, you're not going to hell. Etc. You don't have to be bought out of there or anything like that. But in this process of being made whole, what the sacraments are for, we'll come back to that. You can give to charity. And it would be great if you guys could give to the building of this giant expensive cathedral in the middle of this troubled time. We're having trouble paying for this thing. Martin Luther, who didn't seem to like Italy very much, and it was in Italy, didn't like the lavish lifestyles of some of the leaders. I get it. Wondered why some of the very frugal German people were giving all their money to the Italians <laughs> and what he saw as corrupt people. So you can read the sermons, actually. I've actually got a, a, a book here. Um, I don't have it on me, but it's called The Protestant Reformation. It's just, it's just documents surrounding from the Protestants, from Luther and his change in views, and the Catholics going back and forth on this. But there were preachers who were uh, exaggerating the church's claims, going around to the country. And trying to get indulgence, so hey, you can get out of purgatory, you need to give everything you got, this kind of thing. Just exaggerating. That's not what the church taught, but there were preachers like that. And there were some bishops who lived extravagant lifestyles. So Luther wasn't totally wrong there, 
but also the, the, the contemporary understanding of what that was is totally wrong. It's sort of like, I think giving to charity now is a good thing. Are there charities that take advantage of it? Yeah. Are there people who work in charities who skim off the top? Yes. By the way, in the, I think it's the Council of Trent, the church acknowledged that this was happening, and they reformed. They abol they took Luther's complaints. Like, You're right. Some of this is not, uh, not on the level. Some people were taking advantage of this, and they tried to talk about it before the Reformation, but after the Reformation in the Council of Trent, the Catholic response to the Reformers, they're like, you're right. If I recall, they actually abolished um, those the position of people going around gathering uh, Reformers. Yeah, so indulgence reform. Uh, the 22nd session, I think it is. 21st session. They actually reformed. They acknowledged the corruption and tried to reform it so that people couldn't take advantage of it. So let's take it back to Luther's complaint. All of that is tied to the doctrine of justification. How are we made right before God? So for Luther, he thought, by the way, when the Reformation started, um, now we think of sola fide, faith alone, um, sola gratia, grace alone, sola scriptura, Scripture alone as our only infallible uh, means of revelation from God. Um, I think at the time they didn't really have these material principles really worked out. They were just concerned with the way the church was, which was trying to reform it. I think, um, I, I don't think Luther was, um, I've read a lot of Luther. I don't think he was, a, he, you know Chris, Chris Hitchens? Christopher Hitchens is an atheist, late atheist. He passed away, sadly, of cancer. Christopher Hitchens um, would land blast religion. He'd attack Catholicism, the Catholic Church. He complained about Christians, and he stood for rights and freedom and virtue and all these things. Um, at the end of the day, that appealed to me when I was younger. I thought, okay, maybe, yeah. When you study it out, Christopher Hitchens was kind of full of hot air. He could win a debate by attacking the person, by leveling all these complaints, but he had incoherent arguments he had very little substance and he had nothing to offer in return so if you tear this down what are you going to offer he got nothing i kind of think martin luther was a little bit of that he was a brash man who had some spine that led to some brashness i understand why um but it became an issue with authority and he leveled all these complaints by the way, the same complaints he levels against Catholicism, I could translate for an atheist to level against Christianity. If the Pope could let people out of purgatory right now, why does he do it? If God could heal every sick child right now, why does he do it? You see my point? Those aren't helpful arguments for helping us to make sense of difficult things. Martin Luther had all these complaints. And even though these material principles, sola fide, faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone, etc., were I think hashed out later, these were the formal materials of the Reformation. By the way, as historians will tell you, the Reformation never became cohesive. It became a fragmented movement. And even around these principles, um, it can never be cohesive. It just fragmented. And the wounds have healed over and were genuinely Christians, Baptists, Presbyterians, going to church, seeking God, preaching the gospel, trying to have charity. The wounds have healed over, but the damage done in the 500s was bad 500 years ago. And this never became a cohesive movement. Historians acknowledge this. But if we look back and we try to find what was a material principle of the Reformation, because of faith alone, grace alone, I think justification is the key issue. And this is what I really struggled with. Uh, at some point, I told um, a mentor, a friend of mine, a, a confidant, I see that Christianity has always been sacramental. Maybe I can be an Anglican and have, find a happy middle ground. Um, but... I really struggle with the doctrine of justification because it seems to me 
that the more reformed view of justification is more scriptural. Okay, here's what that means. I'll try not to get too technical, but basically what it means is this. For the Protestant reformers, we are justified by God in Christ Jesus. How that works is this. It's something, there's a technical term called forensic righteousness. Essentially, for the reformers, God declares us righteous. What does that mean? Now, some people have argued with me about this. Declarative righteousness is a technical term. It doesn't mean that God declares something. It means that it's basically like saying this. You are, God is saying you are not guilty because of the foreign righteousness of Jesus of Nazareth, who obeyed God perfectly. Because of his righteousness, I'm going to look at him and not you, sort of, so to speak. And I'm going to see him and say, righteous. And I'm going to take that foreign righteousness and sort of, in a legal way, apply it to your account. It's sort of like if you have a deficit of a million dollars, he's going to take to the penny a million dollars and apply it to your account. Now you're fully paid off. You're not guilty, even though you kind of were guilty. No, I don't see that. Out of God's grace and mercy. I really sort of took that to be the... Now, my theologian friends are like, there's more to it. I get it. I took that to be the New Testament teaching. Wow. I struggled with this. And it turns out other have, others have too. I am convinced now in Galatians, Corinthians, um, Colossians, the Gospels, and even Romans, that the Reformers were incorrect. They thought they were returning the Christian faith back to the original vision, the pureness of the Christian faith of the first century or so. Second century or so. Decidedly not. Now, Alistair McGrath is a Oxford theologian. He was an atheist who became a Christian, studied chemistry, I think, and then started teaching theology. The guy really helped me. He's an Anglican minister. He wrote a book called Justitia Dei, A History of the Christian Doctrine of Justification. He studies historical theology. He had to totally revise his book because somewhere along the way he realized he was incorrect as I did. This is the fourth edition. So what happened was the reformers didn't return us to the original Christian vision. The reformers departed from the original historic view of justification. Page one. One of the defining characteristics of the Protestant Re Reformation is a decisive shift in both the conceptualities and the vocabulary of the Christian theological tradition. AKA, they didn't return us to the original, they were departing from it. As we shall see until the 16th century, the Reformation, the Western theological tradition understood justification primarily as a making righteous through the impartation of an inherent righteous righteousness to a believer. We could talk about this a lot. I should perhaps make a video on this. What this means is this. The reformers thought, you're sinful. You are. I am. You can't save yourself. You can't. I can't. You need God's help. You do. I do. And there's no amount of works I can do to earn God's merit, favor. Um... Before I become a Christian, before I receive God's grace in this way, there is nothing I can do to earn God's love for me. He loves me. I can't save myself. I know me. If you're honest, you know you. We need God's grace, right? You can't save yourself. By the way, the Catholic Church has never taught this. The Reformer said, yeah. But because of what Christ did, he will declare you a righteous person. Essentially in the court saying, not guilty. And then by God's grace, he will sanctify you as you submit to him. Here's a historic Christian view. 
that the Catholic Church has always held. So it's interesting to me, and Alistair McGrath points this out. There's other books on this. There's a book on um, the works of the law, how the first 200 years of Christianity saw what Paul meant by works of the law in the New Testament, referring to the Jewish law, almost, almost always referring to the old covenant law and how it can't save you. Not to say that works can save you now because they can't, they never can. But the Catholic view at the Council of Trent in response to this declarative view simply restated the historic Augustinian view. They believed it up in the first two centuries, but in St. Augustine it was defined a little bit more. And so the Catholic Church is sort of semi-Augustinian, not Pelagian. Uh, Pelagius was a heretic who thought that we don't receive original sin. And because we don't have original sin, we can simply just do a bunch of good things and we're good. Um, we don't need salvation by God's grace if we haven't yet sinned. The traditional Christian view has been, yeah, but our race is broken. You're born on the whole. Your humanity has been tarnished. You need God's grace. Um, and that has always been the historic Christian view in the Catholic Church. So at the Council of Trent, they simply responded and restated the view that justification, how we're made right before God, is not just a legal declaration of righteousness, but Christ, God, by his grace, because of what Christ did, will transform you and make you righteous. You say, I believe that I'm a Baptist. These are the technical terms on which the difference between Protestant theology and Catholic theology resides. The Catholics restated that God in his grace, you can't save yourself on your own. It's all in the Council of Trent. You cannot save yourself on your own. If you think you can just do a bunch of good things and earn God's love, nope, not happening. Earn God's forgiveness, earn heaven. Nope, nope, no one's ever done that. Catholic Church has never taught that. You need God's grace. But salvation in the historic Christian view is transformative. God's grace will renew your inner man. He will transform you. You can't earn that. But God, based on the obedience of Christ, taking on death and sin and all the darkness in humanity and every principality of darkness, took it on and beat it in obedience to the Father. And based on his merit, not mine, his merit, this is according to the Catholic Church, you can have forgiveness and salvation. And he offers this grace to you as a sanctifying, renewing grace that will renew your inner man and make you the person that you're supposed to be. You want to help being a good father? You want to help getting off pornography? You want to help loving your wife the way you're supposed to love her? You want to help being a, a neighbor and a citizen and charitable and a good son? God will give you grace and help you. Your humanity is tarnished, but God's grace will help you grow into the person to love and have charity. He will take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And he will give you the power, not just to declare you righteousness as in not guilty, much more than that. He'll help you make you righteous by his grace. And even when you're becoming righteousness, becoming righteous, it's God's grace working in you. I can't keep the law of Christ in my flesh on my own. I need God's grace for that. And so do you. But the Catholic Church teaches that when you receive, when you repent of your sins, believe on Christ, and then you're baptized, you're brought into the new covenant, just as Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. You're brought into the new covenant, as Paul says um, in Romans and Colossians, the circumcision of the New Testament. And then through the sacraments, as we submit to God, we submit our wills to God, in the sacraments, he's giving you real grace, transforming you. And that's the difference. In the Protestant view, there's a separation between justification and sanctification. In historic Christianity, God's grace is sanctifying. It's working inside of you, transforming you, as you submit your will to God and receive his grace. And this is what Trent teaches. So a lot of my Baptist friends, you're already jumping on board with a passage that says, that, um, yeah, but it says if you believe that faith, uh, faith alone, you're anathema. 
Well, let's read this carefully. So a couple of things here. Um, first of all, the Council of Trent, interestingly, acknowledged that in some of the clergy, there were pockets of the clergy in the late medieval, early Renaissance Europe that were ignorant. And they decided, hey, we got we to gotta really invest money in educating the clergy. This is a low point in, our, in the church. Um, and that's, that's true. And I think that's even reflected in the Reformation. People just didn't understand certain things. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, just as a, as a side note, thought that he complained. I think it was in the Babylonian captivity of the church, in which he thinks the, the Roman Catholic Church is the Babylonian Empire enslaving Christ's church, and we got to liberate it. Um, he thought that, I think it was in that book in which he says that talking about the Eucharist or the Mass as a sacrifice is abominable, and that's not scriptural. Oh, my lands! It is the language of Scripture about the Lord's Supper is deeply sacrificial. Christ is the, our new high priest. He's our Paschal Lamb. He's been sacrificed. Hebrews, the whole book. Um, Christ himself is having a Passover feast, a, a sacrificial liturgical meal. And he's saying, he's saying, just do in memory of me. That's a term saying commemorate. It's not just say remember me. It's, it's a liturgical term. He's a, our new high priest. I don't think Martin Luther just understood these things. The, if you read any of the early Christians about um, their church services, they certainly thought of the Mass, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, as a sacrificial meal. Martin Luther just didn't understand that. But so many of the Catholic clergy um, were just not educated properly, and Trent acknowledges that, by the way, in the Council of Trent. So don't, don't confuse this with the Catechism, of the Council of Trent. This is the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. All right, so. Some things about the Council of Trent. It's talking about justification, and it's pretty beautiful. It's responding to, it's acknowledging the truth in Luther and Calvin, but also responding to the errors and issuing an anathema. Now, anathema doesn't mean automatically, I think, going to hell. It's like church discipline. It's like, hey, these guys are departing from what we've always held. you got to stop. Uh, we've, we've warned you and warned you. you got to stop. And folks, be wary of this. This is doctrine is a departure from the historic Christian faith, which is what historians and theologians are starting to realize, which makes some folks uncomfortable because they are Protestants realizing the Reformation was the departure, not the return. So... He says that, um, Trent says that we do have free will, unlike Calvin, but it's weakened as its powers are downward bent, but by no means extinguished. Because of original sin, our wills are tainted by sin, but not extinguished. You still have a will. Christ died for all. The atonement isn't limited if you're a theologian. Christ died for everyone. The Native American... 3,000 years ago, the um, the Jew, the Gentile, the Roman pagan, the Greeks, Aristotle, Christ died for all, not just some. But he says this, It is furthermore declared that in adults, the beginning of that justification must proceed from the predisposing grace of God through Jesus Christ. Without any merits on their part, they are called. So, Trent is trying to affirm, to make it very clear, that you can't even respond to God and come to him for salvation on your own. It is the predisposing grace of Christ working in your heart. God gives you the grace and assists you to come to him without any merit on your own. You don't earn salvation. You don't work your way to heaven in that sense. And that you freely assent to and cooperate with God's grace. Now, it talks about quite a bit here. The sinner is justified by God by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It talks about the justification, which is not only a remission of sins, which is what the Protestant reformers think, how Baptist non-denominational brothers and sisters think, but also the sanctification and renewal of the inner man through the voluntary reception of the grace and gifts whereby an unjust man becomes just. And from being an enemy, 
becomes a friend, a friend of God, and an heir according to the hope of life everlasting. The causes of this justification are, well, the final cause is the glory of God. Why are we justified? For the glory of God and of Christ and life everlasting. Efficient cause um, by the mercy of God who washes and sanctifies gratuitously, signing and anointing with the Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, how does he do this? It's the Holy Spirit. It's God, not you. It's God who washes you. You can't wash yourself. The meritorious cause. Well, who earned this salvation? Is it you? The merit, Who merited it? The meritorious cause is his most beloved and only begotten, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, when we were enemies, for the exceeding charity with which he loved us, merited for us justification by his own holy passion on the wood of the cross. In other words, Christ merited our salvation. You don't. You can't. Christ merited our salvation. Council of Trent. What is the instrumental cause? Well, repentance and faith and baptism as a sacrament. This is why baptism has always been a big deal in historic Christianity. It's not optional. I think the idea of being a Christian without being baptized is forward into the New Testament. It's a sacrament. It's the circumcision of Christ by which we're brought into the new covenant that Christ instituted on the last Passover meal. And the charity of God is poured forth by the Holy Ghost in the hearts of those who are justified. Which man through Jesus Christ in whom he is ingratiated, engrafted receives in that justification together with the remission of sins all of these infused at the same time faith, hope, and charity. Uh, we could keep going on this. There's, there's so many... Part, well, he talks about Calvin, the, how do you know you're saved, the certainty of salvation, uh, so many things. And here's the difference. When Catholic theologians say you're saved, sometimes Catholics will say we're saved by faith and works. And a Protestant will go, what? How on earth can you be saved by your good works? It's all Christ. To which by the Catholic's own theology, by historical Christianity, by the scriptures, you're saved by Christ. The Catholics, the Catholic theologian, historically, the church, its official documents, will say that salvation is more of a process. We were saved, repentance, faith, and then baptism. We are, which Luther would agree with, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. And many of my Protestant brothers and sisters acknowledge that. We were saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. And that's where the works come in. You haven't merited your salvation. You can't. You can't work your way to heaven. No human being has ever done that. But in the process, once you are saved, once you are a Christian, the renewing work of the Holy Spirit in your life transforms you, and by submitting to your will to the grace of God, you actually can become righteous. You can have charity to which you couldn't have had on your own. You can have virtues to a level which you couldn't have had on your own, and that's the grace of God. But here's the thing. When you obey in perfect charity by the grace of God, and you do something that's actually righteous, the Catholic Church says, yeah, that is meritorious in the sense that that was a good work. It doesn't earn you heaven, but the sense that, yeah, you, this is actually good and not worthy of condemnation. It's meritorious. It merits a reward. Does it mean you're working your way to heaven? You're already saved. You're already a Christian. You've already repented, believed, been baptized, brought in the covenant. But in this sanctifying grace, now your works as you submit to God are virtuous. And by God's grace acting in you, you can fulfill the law of Christ. And in that sense, that's why I use the term merit. I want to be very clear, you can't be saved by works. You can't earn your way to heaven. That is not what they teach at all. Um, here's another example. Thus, neither is our own justice established as our own from ourselves, because you can't do it. Jesus himself, as the head into the members and the vine into the branches, continually infuses us strength and to those justified, which strength always precedes and accompanies, follows our good works, and without which they could not in any manner be pleasing and meritorious before God. So even as a Christian, even as a believer, regenerated, saved, justified, you're becoming more just, more righteous. And I think this is explicitly 
what Paul teaches in Romans. The grace of justification once received is not lost only by infidelity. Um, so on and so forth. Now, here's where my Baptist Protestant friends will quote Trent and say, I'm anathema. Let's read it carefully. Canon 9. Before Canon 9, Canon 1. If anyone says that man can be justified before God by his own works, whether by whether done by his own natural powers or through the teaching of the law without divine grace through Christ, let him be anathema. Reiterating again, if you think you can be saved by doing good things and just earn heaven without the grace of God, no. They're trying to say it again. <laughs> if anyone says after the sin of Adam, man's free will was lost and destroyed, nope. Your will is downward bent, but you still have a will. You still are a moral agent who makes choices. But you need the God, God's grace in order to make the right choices. Canon 9, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. So my Baptist friends will quote this and say, see, you guys think if I believe in faith alone, I'm anathema. It depends on what you mean by this. If anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. This is talking about intellectual knowledge. If you think that you can just have these intellectual propositions of Christianity in your mind and that you don't need the grace of God to dispose your will, to prepare your will, to submit your will to him, let him be anathema. That is not the historic Christian faith. Read St. Augustine, read Paul, read Christ and the Gospels. Intellectual faith, head knowledge, is not the faith of Christianity. It's only part of it. You also need God's grace working in your will to predispose you to accept. And you also must assent your will to God. And that's sanctifying the grace of justification. Um, so what they're saying with faith alone is not faith that repents and believes and submits. They're talking about faith alone without the submission of the will ready to do good works, ready to follow Christ in baptism. Let him be anathema. And I hope that makes sense in the context of the room. All right. So, in the New Covenant, there's a new circumcision. There's new baptism. There's so many more things. There's a new Ark of the Covenant, bearing the presence of God. Uh, Brant Petrie wrote a, a beautiful book on this called Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary. Just real quick, y'all. Um, so, if you look at the Old Testament... You have um, the Ark coming to coming to the King David, the Ark of the Covenant, and you've seen Raiders of the Last Ark, the Ark of the Covenant coming to King David in the Old Testament. Um, the Ark of the Covenant was the dwelling place of God on earth, <clears throat> and you have um, King David saying that when the Ark came to him, he there was shouting, there was jumping, and David said. How is this that the ark of the Lord can come unto me? When the New Testament fulfilling in a larger way and mirroring the Old Testament. What is what does the, the scripture say about Mary in Luke chapter 2? Well, in Exodus chapter 30 or 40, the glory of the Lord and the cloud over the tabernacle containing the ark overshadowed them at Pischiazzo. In Luke chapter 1, by the way, another side note, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, the New Testament writers often use the Greek translation. They often use the Septuagint, which, by the way, contains the books that Protestants have removed. That was hard for me, but it's, if, it's just what happened. They're often using the Greek translation of the scriptures, containing what we call the Apocrypha. That's what the New Testament writers use. But... Here, when Luke is quoting, he's referring back, he's alluding back to Exodus 40, talking about Mary. The Holy Spirit comes upon Mary, and the power of the Most High overshadows Mary. 
episkiazo, overshadow. The same word the scriptures use for the presence of God overshadowing the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God dwelt. The presence of God overshadows Mary, where the presence of God dwelt. And then in Second Samuel, David, when the Ark came to him, he arose and went into the hill country of Judah. In Luke one thirty nine, Mary arose and went into the hill country to Elizabeth. David admits his unworthiness. This is according to Dr. Brant Petrie. The book is inexpensive. Definitely get it. David admits his unworthiness to receive the ark by exclaiming, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? What did Elizabeth say? Elizabeth admits her unworthiness to receive Mary by exclaiming, And why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She almost quotes David. David leaped when the ark was brought in with shouting. And John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb leaped. And there was shouting, a loud shout. And then the ark remained in the hill country in the house of Obed-Edom in 2 Samuel, three months. Mary remained in the hill country with Elizabeth for three months. These are deliberate allusions of Luke um, paralleling the old covenant books to show in the new covenant, this is the ark of the, of the new covenant. So many things like this in the scriptures. We could go on and on in Revelation. Really, the whole New Testament books are paralleling the Old Covenant books and showing how they're fulfilled in this greater, unexpected, kind of like a plot twist way that really happened in human history, which is mind-boggling to me. Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant, etc. And you could we could work this out for hours and hours. I hope this has been a lot. Uh, I hope this has been interesting. I know it's been a lot. Um... But essentially what I could say is this. If I could summarize in four categories of reasons why I'm becoming Catholic, it's because I think the scriptures teach a sacramental worldview in which Christ is God and man. And he instituted a church. And some of those churches inside the church are literally still, you can, we can find them. We can trace this all the way back on the books behind me and read what they wrote. And as Irenaeus said, Jesus taught the apostles. This is what Irenaeus in South France said. We know that heretics and cults are preaching false gospels and false doctrines, perversions, because Jesus taught the apostles. And Jesus and the apostles didn't want the church to immediately fall universally into heresy until Martin Luther or John Calvin. The apostles ordained men, and as Paul told Timothy, keep the traditions that I've passed to you, whether by word or in a letter. They taught them, and we know this is what they believed and taught, just by the simple historical method and by their writings. And then they ordained men, and they ordained men, and they ordained men. And the Catholic tradition, some traditions are bad, but the scriptures do say, keep the traditions that have been passed down by Paul the Apostle. There are good traditions. This is an intellectual and spiritual tradition that's been passed on going all the way back to Christ. You can trace it in these books behind me. The church was always in this Catholic tradition. It was the Catholic Christianity that expressed itself in the world. And for all the corrupt bishops and all the... Um, um, the those ministers, nuns, monks who didn't do the best job with schools or whatever bad situation, I'm sorry if you found you're in, or for the priests who have been corrupt or didn't properly teach their people or form their people, I'm sorry for that. I am. But it doesn't change the fact that Christianity had always been Catholic into the modern world. So here's what I respect. I respect men and women who see the shortcomings in perhaps their fundamentalist Christianity and they want something deeper. They want to go back to the scriptures. They want to go back to history and tradition, right? And so they either try to become more gracious and they fall back on mere Christianity and say, let's not worry about the doctrine so much. Let's just be more gracious with each other than the people we've seen a few years ago. I respect that. Or, hey, we want something deeper. We want, we want the historic Christian faith, right? So let's read the Reformers. Man, we're going to fall back on Calvin and Luther and maybe Zwingli. Um, I respect the fact that these folks really want to know 
what authentic Christianity is. Not mere Christianity, but full Christianity. I respect that. But here's the thing. If you look back to the early church, study the scriptures in light of what the Christians had always said, you will see that the modern world and its forces of reduction and materialism have weighed in on modern Christianity, robbing us of sacraments, robbing us of a view of a world of holy places and holy people, robbing us of a God who acts in our lives, who wants to commune with us, who comes to be with us in a real way in the communion. He hasn't abandoned us. He's with us always into the end of the world. You'll see what the early Christians meant by that, and that the modern world has begun to strip these things away. And even though my Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and all Anglican friends, we're all still Christians. But we have a reduced Christianity. For me, I need the full thing. I was willing to become an atheist if it was true. But it's not. I was willing to become anything if it was true. But by the grace of God, I know that God is true. And Christ is true. And in historic Christianity, I found something so much more beautiful than my reduced Christianity. I found a God who wants to be with us and act in our lives. Who wants to give us grace and give us a means of grace. I found an intellectual tradition that makes sense of life's deepest questions. I read Nietzsche and Sartre and Aristotle and Plato trying to make sense of this modern scientist, Stephen Hawking, trying to make sense of all this. The Christian tradition that you defend as a Christian finds its fullest expression in Catholicism. These are things I've struggled with, but it's simply true. And I say this to you because I owe you an explanation. You need to know where, I've, where I'm at in my life, my thinking, um, if you're my friend. But I also say this as your friend. And if you've been patient enough to sit through all this and you just know me from the internet, if you don't know God through Christ, can I encourage you? As genuinely as I can, seek God. God's not far away from you. If any time you might feel after him and find him. Give away those things in your heart that are holding you down. If you have sin in your heart, you don't want to submit your your heart, your will, your, your life to God because of things that you want to do. By the grace of God, turn to him in repentance and faith. He'll help you give those things up. You have to be willing. Repent. Turn from your sin, self-righteousness. Go to God. Give your will to Christ. He is the King. Submit your heart. Kneel your heart before the King. And then, go to church. At this point, I'll recommend find a stable, genuine Catholic parish, if you can. Drive if you have to. Go, be baptized, seek communion, and grow in grace. And as Peter says, add to your faith, virtue, temperance, all of these things. If you're a Protestant friend, I love you. But what I know is that you love God. And you want the fullness of what he has for you. Can I encourage you, as hard as it is, read the scriptures thoroughly. Read the early Christians. Read history. I think today the Catholic Church has struggles. Um, these are human beings like us. There are priests who are not great. There are bishops who are not great. There are unclear teachers. It's a reality. Don't go to the Catholic Church thinking you found paradise. You haven't. But it is Christ Church. And they'll offer the sacraments to you. And in Christ's church, we can serve our Lord with the unity that he intended. I'm excited to do this with my family. I am all in with Christ. I hope you are too. If you're a Muslim friend, um, please 
examine the history around the life of Jesus. If you're an atheist friend, do the same. Read the scriptures. Seek God. Be willing, pray, and be willing to follow the evidence where it leads. Because the evidence, a little bit of the evidence, might turn you to atheism. All the evidence will turn you to Christianity. It will turn you to God. C.S. Lewis once said, A young atheist cannot be too careful of his reading, because there are traps everywhere. If you study enough philosophy, history, theology, when you study at a basic level, you think, ah, Christianity is stupid. You reflect as a mature person, you see the value and truth and beauty and history to this. I'm going to add a little addendum. A young Protestant, a young Baptist, seeking God, cannot be too careful of his or her reading. There are traps everywhere. Reading the scriptures carefully, not glossing over passages that are difficult, really trying to see them, and then reading what the early church wrote. There are traps everywhere. Uh, I think <laughs> you'll wind up seeking a liturgical tradition. For my own part, I thought maybe I can be an Anglican, and I tried to leave little clues everywhere. So <laughs> when I eventually would become liturgical, an Anglican, Catholic, Lutheran, Orthodox, wherever the evidence led, I wanted there to be little clues to soften the blow so people wouldn't think it came out of nowhere. And I thought maybe I could stay with Anglicanism as a safe middle ground. And the more I reflected, the more I thought, I skipped that step that so many of my good Christians st stop at. And I realized I need to go straight to Christ's church, the historic church, for all its wonders and beauty and history and flawed people and sometimes checkered past. It's Christ church, and I need to be a part of it. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Can I recommend some things to you? Check out Bishop Barron on YouTube. Check out Father Mike Schmitz. Uh, if you like to study scripture a lot, check out Dr. Brant Petrie, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary. Definitely read Ignatius of Antioch, Irenaeus against her Heresies, um, Justin Martyr, Ambrose, St. Augustine. Anything you can read by these people, the Council of Nicaea, even read the Council of Trent uh, in context. Um, I think these things will be a help and a blessing to you and will show the more the, the, the fullness of our faith. Check out what these people say about Mary in the scriptures. Check out Dr. Scott Hahn, who's a, just a good Bible preacher who explains things so much better than I can. Um, he speaks Protestant lingo so he can translate things. Because just as I misunderstood Aquinas until someone translated it, I sort of misunderstood Catholicism like so many of my brothers and sisters do until someone has sort of translated it for me. I hope these things have been a blessing to you. Uh, before I post this, I'm going to pray for you. Would you please continue to pray for me and my family? And I hope to see you in Christ's church.